Okay, hi everyone. Um, let's go ahead and get started with uh, our lecture. Um, so, welcome back to in-person lectures. Uh, so, for the rest of the quarter, the, the lectures will be in person again. Uh, so, hopefully, you guys all managed to find the time to watch those recorded lectures. Um, if not, you might be a little bit lost today. Uh, so, yeah, hopefully, you managed to, to watch those. Um, so, to start out with, I'd just like to give you all some more information on the midterm exam. Um, I know I've talked about this a few times already, but just want to make sure things are you know super clear. Um, so the midterm exam, of course, is coming up on Friday, so you've got a little bit less than a week to study for that. In terms of what you need to study to, to succeed in this exam, uh, you should study, of course, the lectures, so uh, lecture slides, recorded lectures. Uh, you should look at the homeworks and the solutions, so the solutions for uh, the first two homeworks are now available, uh, so make sure you check those out. Uh, and you should have to be pretty familiar with anything that was covered in the discussion sections. Um, so if you know everything on the above, then uh, you should be good to go for the uh, exam. In terms of what's covered on the exam, um, it's everything we've done so far, up to and including logistic regression. Uh, we did uh, start talking about neural networks on Friday's recorded lecture, uh, but there's gonna be no neural networks on the exam, uh, so everything up to logistic regression. It's going to be an in-person exam uh, during the regularly scheduled lecture times, uh, so show up here one o'clock on Friday to take that exam. It'll be a 50-minute exam, and all you need is a pen or pencil, so uh, written exam, uh, you know, no calculator or anything like that. Uh, closed book, uh, no notes, uh, no internet, uh, so on and so forth. Um, you know the drill. There will be assigned seating. Uh, it'll be just randomly assigned seats. Uh, I'll make a post about on uh, Ed about this in a couple of days, uh, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, there will just be uh, assigned seating. Okay, and then so for some additional announcements, uh, the discussion section on uh, Thursday this week will just be midterm review. So make sure you come with questions uh, and uh, are prepared for that discussion section. It's really there for you to, to help you study and review. There will be a sample midterm. Um, I'll say a little bit about that in, I guess now. So uh, I'll put out the sample midterm hopefully tonight. Uh, still a work in progress, uh, but yeah, that should be out to you guys ASAP. Uh, and we'll be going over uh, the sample midterm solutions in uh, that discussion section. Homework two, uh, so that was due last Friday. Uh, we're working on grading that now, and uh, those grades should be out to you shortly. The solutions, as I mentioned, are available on Canvas, so make sure you review those, compare them with your homework submission. Uh, it's a good way to study for the exam. And then another thing coming up is the third homework. Uh, so this is due in two weeks uh, on Friday, May 12th. Uh, it should be released either today or tomorrow. Um, I do know there is an exam coming up this week, so it's gonna be a shorter assignment, uh, and it'll be focused on neural networks. Uh, but do keep an eye out for that, you know, if you maybe want to get started for it, if you're feeling comfortable with uh, the midterm. Okay, so any sort of admin questions uh, on the midterm or upcoming assignments, anything like that, before we get started? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, one question. Um, so the question is, are there any coding aspects on the exam? And the answer is no. Uh, you're not going to be handwriting Python code or anything like that. It'll all be handwritten uh, sort of math algorithm type questions. Yeah. Um, you won't be asked like specific questions about the homework, but you should know the concepts in the homework. Um, yeah, you won't ask to be doing coding, but make sure you understand the concepts and. Yeah, yeah, so the question is, are you required to like know sklearn and various libraries that you used in the homework for the exam? The answer again is no, like no coding. It's all gonna be conceptual, algorithmic uh, style questions. Yeah, another question. Right, you're not gonna be required to write Python code or like fill in the blank Python code or anything like that. Um, but you should know how to kind of like execute the algorithms by hand. You should know the various properties of the algorithm, like runtime complexity, space complexity, um, convex or non-convex loss functions, uh, all these kinds of things. So all of the sort of properties of the algorithms and how to actually do them you should know, but yeah, no, no Python code. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, for um, time complexities or space complexities, as long as you have the dominating terms, you're good to go. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and if any uh, questions come up later on, uh, feel free to post those on the ed board. We'll be sure to get back to you uh, pretty quickly. So to start off today, we're gonna first do a sort of recap of neural networks. So we saw an introduction to these models uh, in Friday's recorded lecture. Uh, and so today we're gonna kind of be reviewing these and you know, going through the details again. They are a fairly complicated model, so I think it's good to see them kind of you know, twice for an introduction. And then after that, we're gonna go into some more details about more complicated neural networks, uh, various details there. And at the very end, we'll see a very short introduction on training neural networks. On Wednesday's lecture, we'll see more details on how to actually train these, uh, and it's you know, quite a bit more complex than fitting a logistic model. Okay, so the first thing to review here is this block diagram for a logistic model. I've shown you guys this picture several times now, but it's you know, quite a conceptually important thing to understand in the sense that if we have a logistic model, a logistic classifier, really what it is is it's a weighted linear combination of my features. So I multiply weights times features, and I add them up. And after doing this weighted linear combination, I apply a nonlinear function, the sigmoid function, to get my model output. And uh, you know, we could represent this mathematically, but you know, there's lots of sort of steps being composed here, and it's useful to represent them in this sort of uh, diagrammatic fashion. In general, a neural network takes this kind of block diagram computational structure and then kind of stacks it on itself in order to get a more complex model. So here I'm gonna recap some vocabulary from Friday's lecture. When we draw a neural network like this with a single hidden layer, on the very left-hand side, we have some nodes, essentially sort of a, a graph almost, where these nodes represent the values of a d-dimensional input vector. So these nodes are you know, some features from my data. The connections between these nodes and the second set of nodes are essentially representing the weights in the first layer of my network. So every edge essentially represents the weight connecting this first feature, x1, to this first hidden unit, h1, so on and so forth. We've got one edge between every feature and every hidden unit. In the middle here, we have our hidden units, also represented as nodes. And these are some numbers, some values, being computed from our data. We have, in general, m hidden units, where this number m can vary. It's a hyperparameter. We can choose it when we're setting up our network. And you should really think of these hidden uh, units, or sort of hidden values, as new features or new representations that we're learning from our data. So we learn some sort of intermediate representation of our data. We then do a very similar computation to the first layer, where we take a weighted linear combination of these hidden units, apply some nonlinear function, and get our output. So in essence, we're essentially stacking together uh, something that looks like a lot of logistic models in order to get a more complex model than we had seen before. We also have these ones kind of floating around down here. And um, these are sometimes referred to as bias terms. And we include these essentially to account for that extra weight in like a logistic model that's not multiplied with the feature. So it's kind of like the, uh, the intercept term in a linear model, if you like. The total collection of all the parameters in a neural network we're gonna represent with theta. And this is just the weights in all of our layers. So it's a big long vector containing all of our weights. In general, if you have one of these hidden, uh, single hidden layer neural networks, if you just count up the number of weights that we have, you'll have something on the order of d times m weights. So it's scaled linearly in the dimensionality of the data, so the number of features, and the number of hidden units that you choose. So if you have more hidden units, a bigger, more complex network, you're gonna have a lot more weights in your network as well. Okay, these single hidden layer neural networks are often called feed-forward neural networks or multi-layer perceptrons because there's sort of multiple layers of computation happening in a sort of feed-forward way, if you like. You take your data and sort of flow it through this network to get your output. So we'll see lots more details on, you know, how this computation actually happens throughout the rest of today's lecture, uh, but this is good terminology to keep in mind. Okay, let's look at a fairly comp a uh, concrete example of a, a small neural network with a single hidden layer. So I have two input features, x1 and x2, so my data is two-dimensional, and I additionally have this bias term here. Each of my features is connected to each of my hidden units, so 
So x1 is connected to h1, it's connected to h2. x2 is also connected to h1 and h2. And the same thing for my bias term. This h1 and h2 then are connected to the output of my network. And the same for the bias term of the output of the network. So to do computation with a neural network, what we do is we need to compute each of these sort of um, unknown or intermediate nodes. So we observe some data point, x1 and x2. We know our data. We can put this into the model. To compute the values uh, for h1 and h2 then, we take a weighted linear combination of our data, of our features. Uh, essentially, we have some weight associated with uh, the edge from x1 to h1 and the edge from x2 to h1 and some weight associated from this bias term to h1. So we've got a weight for each of these input nodes. We do the multiplication, sum them all up, and then apply some nonlinear function on top of that. So again, you can think of h1 as being computed in a really similar way to the output of a logistic model. We'll do the exact same thing for h2 to get some value for h2. Um, but the weights on the edges between x1, x2, and 1, and h2 are going to be different weights than those connecting them to the first hidden node. OK, so now we've got some sort of intermediate representation of our data. In order to get the output of our model, we now do essentially the same procedure, uh, except compute it on the hidden units uh, in order to compute the output. So we'll take a weighted linear combination of the value of h1, h2, and the bias term, sum them up, apply a nonlinearity, and get the output of our model. Oftentimes, uh, if we want to be really explicit, we can write uh, values for the weights on each of our edges. So for example, w11 is the weight connecting x1 to the hidden node h1. w12 is the weight connecting x1 to the hidden node h2, so on and so forth. And we'll often write w sub 0 for the weights connecting the bias terms to the hidden units. In terms of the weights connecting the hidden units to the output, uh, we'll often write those as betas. So beta sub 1 connects the first hidden unit to the output, uh, so on and so forth. So again, this is a really simple neural network where we can kind of write everything out very explicitly. OK, let's see this in terms of uh, sort of the underlying equations now, rather than this more, diagra more diagrammatic viewpoint. So our feature vector, again, is two-dimensional. consists of two features, x1 and x2. We have some nonlinear function g, uh, which we're going to apply in order to get our hidden units. So for example, this nonlinear function could be a sigmoid function. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be. We'll see different uh, activation functions later on. But it's some nonlinear function uh, that we're going to apply. So to get h1, the value for my hidden node, as I said, we take a weighted linear combination of my data. And we have w01 coming from the bias term. And then we apply our nonlinear function on top of that. To get the value for h2, we'll do the exact same thing, except now we're using different weights in order to compute the value for h2. So these equations, again, should look pretty familiar. It's, it's essentially the equation for a logistic model. Then to get the output of my model, uh, f, I just do the same procedure now, except I'm taking a weighted linear combination not of my original data, but rather of those hidden units. So I do beta 1 h1 plus beta 2 h2 plus beta naught. So that's essentially you know, these weights here on the second half of my network. And then I apply my nonlinear function on top of that again. The parameter vector theta now uh, corresponds to all of the weights in this network. So it's all of the w's and all of the betas. OK, in general, you might have more than just two input uh, features, of course. And so uh, you also might have more than just uh, two uh, hidden units. So in general, the value for the nth hidden unit in a network with more than two hidden nodes uh, can be represented as follows. Again, a weighted linear combination of uh, your data with the appropriate weights uh, plus an activation function. The output of the network is then the you know, same exact idea, except we have more than just two hidden units. So here I sum over all of the hidden units in my network with those appropriate weights beta, and apply that activation function again. Oftentimes, uh, it's not very convenient for us to draw a picture for our network and you know, write down weights on all these edges. You know, imagine you had a network with 100 layers in it. It's just not practical. So in general, uh, we find it uh, useful to write down the weights in terms of a matrix. 
So capital W is going to represent uh, the weight matrix of my network, uh, in particular the weights for the first layer in the network. And what I'm going to do is that for every row in this matrix, I'm going to collect all of the weights corresponding to uh, the uh, uh, corresponding feature. So W sub 1 is all the weights corresponding to the first feature. It's the weights on those edges connecting x1 to my hidden units. W2 is all the weights connecting x2 to the hidden units, uh, all the way up to, say, Wm, uh, connecting uh, all my data uh, up to the uh, mth hidden unit here. Okay, so you can write this out as a, as a matrix with m rows, one for each hidden unit, uh, and d plus one columns, one for each of my features. I can also write my data x as just a column vector here. Uh, so you know, this is just my data in, in a vector. What I can do now is I can sort of write down the uh, sort of pre-activation for all my hidden units, i.e. the values before applying the nonlinearity in a very simple way as just a matrix vector multiplication. So if you actually take your weight vector and multiply it with your data vector, uh, you'll get uh, essentially the, the linear combinations of your features and the corresponding weights for every single of the m hidden units in the network. Um, these are often called like pre-activations because they're just linear combinations of feature and data. We didn't do the nonlinearity step yet. And then to actually get the values of each of my m hidden nodes, I of course need to apply that nonlinear function. Uh, so that's g here. We'll often write just g of wx, but what we really mean by that is applying g kind of pointwise to each of these pre-activation values. So we'll get g of w1x, g of w2x, so on and so forth. These are precisely the values of my hidden nodes. So it's just some nice sort of compact notation for you know, working with the weights and the layers in my network. So that was how you get the hidden values, and we can do something really similar for the outputs of my network. So if I write my weights beta corresponding to the second uh, layer of weights in my network, let me write it as a row vector because it'll make things easier. If I have my vector of hidden unit values, so this is just collecting all the values of my hidden nodes, I can write the output of my network as an activation function g applied to those weights, uh, essentially taking the dot product with those hidden values. So again, really a clean way of writing down uh, all of the, the computations you need to do in this network. Okay, so any questions on this uh, sort of simplest neural network setup? Um, I think I may have misspoke. So the first row here is all the weights connecting the data to the first hidden node. So W1 is the weights for H1, W2 is the weights for H2. Um, we have one per hidden node. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Yeah. How do we get the weights? Yeah, that's, well, that's the question, right? Um, so we'll eventually see how you actually learn the weights in a neural network. For now, we're assuming we just know what these weights are, uh, but we'll eventually, yeah, have to learn these based on our data. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I'm not sure I understand that question. Could you could you maybe rephrase it? Yep. Yeah. So so far, the notation I've introduced is only for a single layer. Um, we'll see more notation in a little bit for multi-layer networks. Um, so yeah, capital W in that notation is all of these weights together. Uh, beta is all of these beta weights together. Cool. Any other questions? Um, we're going to see more complicated neural networks after this, so if you have any questions, now is a, a good time to have those clarified. Okay, cool. So let's see some more complicated neural networks now that we've uh, kind of seen our, our smallest, simplest, uh, non-trivial network. So, so far, the only model we've seen is a neural network with a single hidden uh, unit. Uh, so in essence, we only have a single layer in our network. 
Of course, though, we can, there's no reason we need to stop with a single layer. You know, we could stack these deeper and deeper and deeper. So in general, you have some vector x representing your data. You connect them to a vector of hidden units with some mate, uh, weight matrix w1. So these are the weights associated with, you know, essentially the computation from going data to, to my first hidden layer. In the uh, network we just saw, we usually go from that hidden unit straight to the model's output, but we could instead add another intermediate layer of hidden nodes. And what we can do to get H2 is essentially take weighted linear combinations of the first hidden layer, uh, compute them in exactly the same way as we did previously, and then uh, eventually we have some sort of final output uh, readout layer, exactly as we had before. So we just kind of are stacking more and more layers in our network. Um, and in general, you can have uh, different numbers of hidden units in each one of your network, or each one of your layers. So here, H1 is represented as having more hidden units than H2. Um, and we'll see more details on this uh, throughout uh, today's lecture. So uh, of course, we can stack even more layers than just two hidden layers. Uh, so I'll typically try to use W sub capital L to represent the total number of hidden layers in a network. Um, in general, the number of uh, layers you have in a network is sort of a hyperparameter of your model, so you're free to choose how big you want to make your network. And networks that have more than one hidden layer are often referred to as deep neural networks. Um, so the depth uh, generally corresponds to sort of how many layers you have, and another piece of terminology is the width of your network, which is kind of how many hidden units you have in each of these hidden layers. So you might be wondering now, like, why would we make our network have more than one hidden layer? Like, what's the benefit of doing this? And in fact, we saw in Friday's lecture that if you have a single hidden layer neural network, so just one hidden layer, and you make that layer infinitely wide, you can actually represent any smooth function. Uh, sometimes neural networks are referred to as like universal approximators. So no matter what function you give me, maybe I want to do some really complicated classification problem. If I make my single layer network big enough, then you know, I can actually fit that classification problem. Uh, of course, this is going to be impractical to actually do, because uh, usually the number of hidden nodes that you need grows exponentially with sort of the complexity of your problem. So you're going to need a very, very large number of hidden nodes in your, your network to, to fit a very complicated problem with just one layer. But if we use multiple layers, what we can do is essentially have our layers learn sort of intermediate representations of our data that the later layers then kind of combine together and reuse in various ways. Um, and later on, we'll see some really cool examples of how this works with image classification problems. But the general idea is that with a multi-layer network, you're learning sort of a, a compositional function that can glue together pieces from the earlier layers. And generally, this makes it more easy for your network to represent very complex functions. Um, so yeah, you, you kind of have two knobs to control the complexity of your network, the depth and the width, and there's a trade-off between these two. Beyond having networks with multiple hidden layers, we can also have networks with multiple outputs. So everything we've seen so far uh, has been with uh, just single output networks, you know, doing binary uh, classification problems. But we could have, in general, capital K outputs. So maybe we're doing uh, classification with K different classes. And uh, we can handle those in a very similar way to what we've done so far. In order to handle these, uh, so if we have K different outputs representing K different classes in a classification problem, uh, the output activation function for our network, so our final nonlinearity, is no longer going to be a sigmoid function that maps uh, unnormalized scores into the range 0, 1, but we're going to apply this softmax function that we saw before for multi-class logistic regression. Um, so exact same idea. We're turning sort of the final unnormalized score uh, coming from our, our model into a vector of probabilities. What this means is we can interpret the kth output of my model as some probability corresponding to the label being uh, k uh, given some data point x. Um, so just a piece of warning here, uh, we previously used capital C to represent the total number of classes in our problem. Here we're going to use capital K. So again, you can have networks that do multi-class classification. OK, there's a really cool example online uh, at this URL. So highly recommend you guys uh, take some time and play around with this. It's a lot of fun. But what you can do is that uh, online uh, on this web page, you can vary the number of uh, neurons in a neural network, the number of hidden layers, so on and so forth. And you can get it to try and fit some data. So what you're seeing here is uh, 
uh, essentially nodes representing uh, inputs in a 2D problem. The uh, sort of width of these connections represents how large or how small the various weights are. And at the final output here, you're seeing uh, essentially the classification probabilities coming from my model. So we saw really similar things for logistic models where uh, uh, now dark orange represents uh, sort of the probability associated with the orange class. Dark blue represents the uh, probability associated with the blue class. So we can see that even with a pretty small neural network, uh, just two hidden layers, four neurons here and two neurons here, um, you know, we get some pretty complicated decision boundaries. Um, and there's some harder problems online on this website, so you can play around with the network and you know, try to get it actually fit those problems. Um, so yeah, just a cool demonstration, definitely check it out. Okay, let's see here an example of a neural network with three outputs, just to make this a little bit more concrete, uh, put some notation to it. It's the same network I had before with uh, two input features, two hidden units, except now I'm gonna say uh, use this network to do a, a multi-class classification problem with three different classes. So that means I need to have three outputs for my network, one for each class. And rather than just having uh, one collection of beta parameters connecting my hidden units to that single output, I now need a beta parameter connecting each of my hidden units to each of my possible outputs. So again, I'm just wiring everything together between the layers and giving them some associated weights. And again, at the end of the day, we take a soft max over those pre-activations, those weighted linear combinations, in order to ensure that these represent a valid probability distribution over my possible classes. Um, one thing to note here is that since the outputs of your network are guaranteed to sum to one, they represent a probability distribution. Well, if you know the first two outputs of the network, you should know the third output, right? It's just gonna be one minus the sum of the previous two. Um, and so we really only need k minus one outputs from the network, but people in machine learning are lazy uh, and we often just use k outputs. Um, there's sort of nothing wrong with parameterizing your network in this way. Okay. So let's uh, put, put some equations down just to see how we can represent these multi-output networks. So the output of my network for the kth class, so f sub k on some data point x, is gonna be the softmax function, uh, which is given down here, it's this uh, exponentiation, applied to the weighted linear combination of my hidden units times now the appropriate beta weights. So previously my betas only had one subscript, now I need two subscripts because I'm computing k different outputs. So exactly the same idea, we just have more weights, more subscripts hanging out. And again, just a reminder on the softmax function, uh, sort of what this is doing. It's turning these unnormalized scores, these just weighted linear combinations here, into a valid probability distribution. We make them positive by exponentiating them, and then we normalize so that they sum by one by the denominator here. Um, so yeah, if you're uh, rusty on how the softmax works, uh, go review the lecture slides for logistic regression. Okay, um, so we saw the equations for how to work with uh, neural networks with uh, a single hidden unit, a single hidden layer, and arbitrary numbers of outputs. Um, of course, we can write down equations for representing uh, sort of arbitrary networks now. Um, so these are networks with m hidden units and uh, k potential outputs. And again, we can write them really compactly in this sort of matrix vector uh, form. So I have a matrix W of weights in my first layer in my network. If I do W times X, this matrix vector multiplication, uh, and I add sort of my bias vector, this is sort of my pre-activations. These are my weighted linear combinations. And then to get the values of the hidden units, I just apply that uh, nonlinear function that I choose. And then to get the outputs of my network, I of course just do same thing, except now I use my beta weights and use the softmax uh, activation function. So just some nice notation. Okay, um, so uh, this notation here is when you have m hidden units, so m nodes in my first hidden layer. We of course can have sort of arbitrary numbers of hidden layers and arbitrary numbers of outputs. So the equations I'm gonna show you here are for now the most general network that you can really work with in terms of a feed-forward multi-layer perceptron. So to get the values of my first hidden layer, um, it's the same equation I had before, where I take a weighted linear combination of my data and apply a nonlinear function on top of that. Now here I have a subscript for my weight matrix, 
So W sub 1 is the weights in the first layer of my network. And note that I'm applying that weight matrix to the data. To get the values for the ELF hidden uh, uh, vector in my, met in my network, I now have a new weight matrix, W sub L. But rather than applying that weight matrix to the data, I apply it to the values of the hidden uh, nodes in the previous layer. So same exact computation. We just change the weight matrix and change what values we're applying that to. And then the output is exactly the same as we had before, except we're applying that to the final hidden uh, vector in our network. OK. So uh, let's look at an example of applying neural networks on some you know, real world actual data. So here we're going to be applying it to this MNIST data set that you guys worked with in a previous homework. It's this uh, uh, data set of handwritten digits. So we've got uh, 10 classes in this problem, uh, 0 through 9. And each of my uh, input images is uh, 784 dimensional. So it's a pretty high dimensional classification problem. Now, if you remember from the homework, the way we represent these images is we essentially uh, take our pixel values, unroll them into a really long vector, and then we can just stick them into our neural network as we've been talking about. I'm going to use two hidden layers here, so a pretty small network. And each of my unit, or each of my hidden layers is going to have 200 hidden units. Um, you might be wondering where these numbers come from, 200 hidden units, two hidden layers. Uh, and the answer is guess and check, basically. We need to do tons of experimentation to get these things to work. Uh, but these numbers just happen to work on this data. So if I fit my model, which uh, you'll have to trust me that you, know, you can actually learn these models from data, um, and you look at the weights in the network, we'll see some pretty interesting things. So in each of these uh, images here, each of these uh, you know, uh, essentially uh, boxes of numbers, I'm representing the activations of my network. So what I mean by that is I took an image, some handwritten digit, I passed it into my network, and I looked at the values of those hidden units. So I'm doing that feed forward computation, and I'm looking at those, those hidden, uh, hidden nodes. And if I essentially turn those hidden nodes into an image, um, what you'll see is that each of these has a sort of activation pattern, if you like. And so what's really going on is that um, my network has kind of, kind of learned how to extract features from my data. So here is almost like a feature detector for an image that picks up on images that have uh, some uh, handwritten marks in this top right corner. This uh, sort of picks up on uh, handwritten marks in the bottom left corner, so on and so forth. And then what happens is that in the second layer of our network, which is a weighted linear combination of those hidden values, it's going to essentially weight all of these representations and then uh, feed them through essentially a logistic model in order to do that classification. So in other words, what's really going on is our network is a, some kind of feature extractor. It takes our data, it learns some intermediate representation of that data, shown here, and then it acts on that intermediate representation to actually do the classification. So I'd like to take a second to compare this with uh, sort of the weights from a logistic model. So if you remember, in a logistic model, we have one collection of weights per class, which means that in this MNIST problem, we'll have a total of uh, 10 different weight vectors. And if you plot those weight vectors, what you'll see is they learn sort of per digit representations. So these are the actual weights learned from a logistic model. And you can see they learn like eights and nines and sevens and so on. But what this means is that in my logistic model, I really need one representation per digit. So it's on a per class basis. In contrast, a neural network here kind of learns reusable representations. You know, it can kind of glue together uh, sort of detecting you know, something in the top right with detecting something in the bottom left. So it's a sort of automatic way of detecting features or sort of information from my data. Okay, here's another more interesting, uh, I think, example. So now here, rather than a single hidden layer in my network, I have three hidden layers. And this is being applied to a facial recognition data set. So I pass in some image of a face, and I want to classify, um, I think, what person it is. It's a, some, some celebrity faces data set. And if we do that same visualization we did before, and we look at the weights in the first layer of my network, what we see if we plot these weights are essentially edge detectors. So here we see some, some weights that will pick up on horizontal edges, uh, some weights that will pick up on vertical edges, so on and so forth. 
And if you've ever taken like an image processing class, uh, people uh, in the past had often spent you know, tons and tons of time hand designing weights, essentially, to extract these types of features from our data. But if we look at the second layer in our network, our model essentially learns to combine these features into higher level kind of representations of our data. So in this top left uh, image here, we see some kind of like eye detector that my, my network picked up on. Uh, you know, maybe this is another eye here. We've got like a nose detector, uh, so on and so forth. And here, you know, these aren't images from my data set. These are, these are features that my model learns to extract from the data. And in layer three, it combines these features even further to learn sort of a more sophisticated, complex, uh, sort of internal representation of the data. So again, this goes back to the idea of neural networks as sort of feature extractors or sort of automatic feature detectors. If we wanted to apply just a logistic model to this faces data set, um, you know, one way we talked about uh, extracting features from data are these like polynomial feature expansions, where we had to write down equations to extract features from our data. But you know, imagine writing down an equation that would extract an eye from a, an image. You know, how could you possibly do this? So neural networks are really handy at you know, sort of automatically picking up on these kinds of features. I'll point out that before deep neural networks, uh, a lot of work in machine learning essentially went into designing methods that were able to detect or extract features from data. Uh, so for example, in vision, there was these uh, uh, methods called like SIFT and HOG that would uh, sort of extract those high-level features that I had shown you before. There would be then some unsupervised learning step, essentially dimensionality reduction. We'll see that later in the course. And then you would pass those sort of hand-designed features into a model like logistic regression or KNN or something like that. But this whole pipeline is very hand-designed. Um, you know, and it's the same thing for speech or NLP, where we would hand-design some, some feature extractor from our data. But since the advent of deep neural networks, uh, this sort of paradigm has completely been dropped and everything is now just learned sort of end-to-end -end from data. Okay, is there any questions on these more complex neural network setups? Right, yeah, let me give you an example. So in MNIST, there's 10 different classes, right? If we take a single image, a single handwritten digit, and pass it through my network, what my network is gonna output is a 10-dimensional vector, where we have one number per class. The first output represents essentially the model's belief that this was a handwritten digit of a zero. The second output is what's the probability that this is a, a one, so on and so forth. So we get one probability associated to every possible class, uh, and essentially it represents a, a distribution of the possible labels for this image. Yeah, in general, the relationship between sort of the size of your layers and the values of the weights and so on and so forth, very empirical. Um, essentially, you can't, th these models are so complex that you can't really do better than fit it to data and see what happens. Um, so yeah, neural networks are very, very much an empirical uh, science. Cool, other questions on uh, more complex networks? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, why do we have this nonlinear function g in here instead of just doing a bunch of linear functions? Um, I probably should have made this a little more explicit, but if you just, if you drop these activation functions and just apply linear maps over and over again, you'll just get a linear function at the end of the day. Like, if I compose two linear functions, it's a linear function. So if I don't have these nonlinearities, my networks can only represent 
linear mappings from the data to the output. Of course, we want to learn nonlinear functions, and so that's the purpose of these additional nonlinearities. Okay, cool. Um, so if I understand the question correctly, the cool thing is you don't choose. You let the network do it for you. So the network automatically kind of extracts these features from your image, and then it learns to automatically combine these features in order to make a classification. So everything here is not hand-designed. It's learned from the data itself, and the network just picks up on these things in order to minimize the loss function at the end of the day. So kind of the point I was trying to emphasize here is you, you don't pick features, you just let the network learn them. Yeah, I can do you one more question. No, so in this slide there's no deep learning. This is, this is what machine learning looked like before neural networks really took off. Um, so you would do some kind of hand-designed feature extractor, and then apply some really simple classifier on top of it. Neural networks take care of sort of this feature extraction and unsupervised learning and even the supervised part. This whole pipeline is just one neural network now. Okay, so in the interest of time, let's move on to the next part of today's lecture and talk about uh, the concept of a neural network architecture. So uh, as we've seen them so far, feed forward neural Feed-forward networks uh, consist of multiple layers of essentially matrix vector multiplications followed by nonlinearities. One of the really nice things about these uh, networks is that uh, they're very suitable for working with uh, GPUs, graphical processing units. So GPUs, if you're not familiar, piece of hardware that originally were designed for sort of graphics applications. And they're really designed to do uh, matrix vector multiplications very, very quickly. But because neural networks essentially only consist of matrix vector multiplications, it's you know, a fairly simple computation, uh, we can use GPUs to really speed up neural networks. Um, so sort of this combination of nice model architectures plus GPUs has really led to the rise of very powerful networks. Um, in practice, uh, sort of real world modern neural networks for things like uh, vision applications or text or speech, uh, anything like that, uh, are usually a lot more complicated than just these simple feed-forward networks that I've shown you so far. So uh, we can add things like residual connections, convolutions, attention mechanisms, so on and so forth. And the world of deep learning is you know, quite big and there's lots of things going on. So in this course, we won't be able to cover all the nitty-gritty details of what people actually do with neural networks nowadays, uh, but we'll eventually see some of these more complex architectures. But what I mean by architecture is just some way of wiring up some kind of uh, network, some kind of connections from data to nodes uh, that you know, makes use of uh, matrix vector multiplications. So let's see an example of a more complicated neural network than just a feed-forward network. This is called a convolutional neural network. And the way it works is it takes uh, this operation called convolution. Uh, we'll see it in a little bit in a couple of weeks. That essentially uh, extracts features from my image but it does it in a way that's different than just matrix vector multiplications that we saw before. So there's some feature extraction step that sort of scans over my images and uh, gets some feature representations, just like we saw before. And at the very end of the day, there's some classification network on top of that, where this classification network uh, essentially takes these learned features and actually does the classification step. So this classification network is usually a feed-forward network but this feature extraction step can be something much more complex than a feed-forward network. Another example of a pretty popular uh, model structure here. So here I'm showing you a diagram of this model just, just to illustrate that these things can get complicated very quickly. Um, this is called AlexNet from 2012. This is one of the first deep neural network models that you know, really worked in practice on some real-world problems. And I'd like to point out here that these net networks are huge. So this 
fairly simple model from way back in 2012 had something like 60 million parameters in it. You know, compared to something like logistic regression models that have d plus 1 weights in them, um, this is absolutely massive scale. Since these models nowadays have so many parameters in them, um, they also require a huge amount of data in order to actually fit these parameters. So a more complex model requires a whole lot more data. This model was trained on something like a million different data points, uh, and this took about a week of training time. Uh, this is with GPU acceleration, too. So uh, you know, this is really just to point out that these models can get very complex. Another example of a very deep neural network is something like uh, GoogleNet, which came out in 2015. This network has something like 27 layers, so a very deep network here. Uh, and it uses something called an inception module that lets it uh, cut down on the number of parameters. So it has fewer parameters than AlexNet, but yeah. Again, just showing this to show that there's a, a whole host of models out there. Nowadays, uh, uh, sort of the ancient world of models from 2015 with only 4 million parameters, uh, things like GPT-3 and ChatGPT use complex model architectures called transformers or attention. Uh, and these models have on the order of like 175 billion parameters. So, you know, way larger than the models we had even a few years ago. Um, and interestingly, just to store this model, like if you wanted to load this in your computer, you're going to need 800 gigabytes of RAM. So if you play with ChatGPT, uh, really under the hood, what you've got is a box of 175 billion numbers that somehow is producing uh, cool text for you guys. Uh, in this class, we won't be able, of course, to get into all the details of these attention mechanisms, um, but you know, just to highlight that these feedforward networks that we've been learning about in class are you know, very simple compared to what people do nowadays. Um, here's a graph that I think is really cool. On the x-axis is a publication date for various models. So this ranges between 1954 with really the very, very first machine learning models uh, all the way up to 2021. And on the y-axis, I have the number of parameters in these models. And what you should notice is that the y-axis is on a log scale. So these modern models are, you know, they're linear on a log scale, so the number of parameters is growing exponentially, uh, and this curve really shows no sign of slowing down. There's some rumors that GPT-4, sort of the, the biggest and best language model nowadays, has something like a trillion parameters in it. Um, it's unconfirmed, so don't quote me on that, but you know, these models just get bigger every year. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we're gonna go ahead and try to wrap up here. Uh, was a little ambitious with today's lecture, I guess. Um, so just to wrap up really quickly, um, you should think of neural networks as feature extractors. They sort of take data, learn some features from them in an automatic data-driven way, and then on top of those internal learned representations, the model then performs classification. These networks often have very many parameters and they just keep getting larger. Uh, so way back in 2012, order of 10 million parameters, but even larger for modern networks. One thing I'll point out here is that neural networks often have a huge number of hyperparameters associated with them. You know, how do you choose how many hidden units to use, how many layers in your neural network, uh, what activation function should you choose, so on and so forth. So getting your model to actually work on real data is, is an arduous task and takes tons and tons of experimentation. In the third homework, you'll get to uh, play around with these and you know, see what it's like to actually fit a network to data. And in the next lecture, uh, we'll mostly be focused on training networks. So how do you actually fit these models to data? We'll be doing that using two algorithms. Uh, the first is the backprop algorithm for backpropagation. Uh, this will let you get the gradients of your network. And then we'll see uh, an algorithm called stochastic gradient descent, which is a version of gradient descent. Okay, and that's all. Uh, see you guys on Wednesday.